When I made the decision to see Jeremy in prison, I was a little nervous because I hadn't seen him in person in quite a while. I did want to see him. I was I was excited to to see him in person, but I was also nervous about going to a prison because it was the first time that I'd ever visited a prison before. So before you visit, you have to fill out the form. It's literally one paper. They have one for those who speak English and those who speak Spanish. And you fill out the form and you turn it in to the prison system. And it takes about, I, I don't know how long it normally takes, but for me, it was about two or three days. And after that, they do a background check on you. After they do the background check and you know everything clears out, then you will be approved. And then after you're approved, then you can start asking to visit whichever inmate you're interested in seeing. I guess you all probably have figured out who it is by now, who decided that they weren't gonna fill out any forms to see Jeremy despite the relationship that they have with him. So they didn't fill out anything. Um, when he was in Orlando, to my knowledge, they still haven't. Um, I filled my form out. Like I said, it only took about two or three days. I was on the phone with them for like maybe, you know, one day going back and forth and then everything came back clear and then I was able to see him and I immediately booked a visitation for that weekend. I visited Jeremy in county jails before. I've never, like I said, I've never been to a prison to see anyone. So it's not that different. They're a little more strict, obviously, with prison life, but it's not that different as far as what you can and cannot bring, what you can and cannot wear. It's better because you're able to stay there for as long as you want during the visitation hours. It's between, well, the facility that he was in before was, was between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. And you could talk to the inmate in person. You can touch them, hold them, kiss them. So that was one of the better things about him being in a prison. The whole dress code thing, you know, obviously it's harder for me because I don't really wear conservative clothing, although I probably should. You know, pretty much everything I, I have, it's either short or it shows cleavage. So I always have like these specific dresses or, you know, clothing that I have when Jeremy goes into the system because I know that they will pass any type of rules that they have about dress requirements. But I noticed that the rules were different for certain women. So I noticed that, you know, I'm I'm more petite and when I went in there and I, and I had a dress that was like down to my ankles, literally. And I had like a little sweater over it and I passed a couple of people and they were like, okay, that's fine. And then I got to one individual and she was just kind of like, ugh, ugh, like, what are you wearing? Uh, yeah, what I'm wearing is perfectly fine. But then there were other women who were, you know, heavier than me who had like these tight, tight short dresses on. And it's like, okay, so I guess if you're really small, then you're going to be scrutinized more. And if you're larger, then you can just wear whatever the fuck you want to wear, I guess. And I just want to clarify that this was not in Sumter County. This was in Orlando. This was not Sumter County. So I haven't had any issues with Sumter County yet. Um, but yeah, this was the Orlando facility. So when I went to go see him in prison, all I had was literally the clothes on my back and I had my license and oh yeah. And I had, um, different items in a Ziploc bag. So like keys or I'm sorry, a key, you can only bring one key. Um, just different, just different things like, um, lip gloss, gum, things like that. And I brought all of those in a clear Ziploc because you, that's the only thing you can really bring in. And then after that, you have to go through a metal detector. It's one by one. So only one at a time can go inside and you put everything like in little baskets and then you have to go through the metal detector. You have to say, you know, they ask you, what did you bring with you? And you have to, you know, check off everything that you brought with you either in the baskets or on you. Then after that, you have to get into a line. So the women get into one line, the men get into another and the men are patted down by male officers. The females are patted down by female officers. You have to go into this little room and you basically have to be patted down again. Um, if you're wearing a bra or anything, then you have to like shake out your bra to make sure that there's nothing like being hidden in your bra. You have to lift up your shoes. You have to, you know, basically show them everything that you're wearing. The facility that he was in was called Central Florida Reception Center or CFRC. And it was like, when I went inside, it was um, like this little lunchroom area. It was, it was actually really cute despite the fact that 
he was in a prison. I'm assuming there are probably like a lot of kids that visit their parents or, you know, other relatives that are there because they had all, all these little paintings, like these Nickelodeon paintings, and they had Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. And I'm like, does Disney World know about this? I don't I don't think Disney knows about what's happening here. There were a couple of other ladies there that were really helpful and I noticed that they were getting up and getting different like styrofoam cups and uh, utensils and things like that, plates. And I was asking like, you know, you know, do we have to go and get that stuff first? And they were saying, well, you know, when everybody starts coming in, it gets really crowded. So they were just kind of showing me the ropes and helping me out. So that was really nice. So I went and I got, you know, the plates and the cups and everything because at some point they open up this little station and the station has burgers and like little McRibs, but they're not real. It's not real food. It, I mean, okay, it is, but it's not. It's frozen food, but it's probably the closest thing to real food there. You can pay for those in cash. In fact, I think you can only bring cash. I brought about, I think like 40 or $50 and we ended up using pretty much every dollar because Jeremy was so hungry. I don't want to say that he was hungry. Maybe he was just really greedy. That's probably like the right terminology. He was very greedy that day. I got everything wrong before I even saw him. I sat in the wrong seat. Apparently when you are in prison, or at least in that facility, the inmates have to face the guards because they want to see what they're doing. I don't know. So um, I had to move to a different seat and they were about 20 minutes late. Although Jeremy said they were like standing outside waiting and the guard just wouldn't let them in. I don't know why. Um, and he eventually came in the room at like 920. And I don't know, it was just, it was really surreal seeing him like that. He wasn't in handcuffs or chains or anything like that. He was just wearing like this all blue outfit and he had like these Crocs, these black Crocs. <laughs> um, he was just like, you know, he looked really comfortable. And I got up and we hugged and we kissed. And it was, that was the first time that I'd seen him in a long time. I think the first thing that I said to him was hi. And I didn't know what else to say. So I was like, hi. I felt really shy, probably. I felt kind of like nervous. So yeah, he just started laughing. And then he asked me, he said, you know, have I gotten fat? Do I have a bunch of tattoos? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said that, you know, apparently online, on YouTube, people have been saying that he got really fat and he has all these tattoos, which is like the complete opposite. He doesn't have any tattoos and he lost weight and he's in shape now. He's been working out a lot, you can tell. So yeah, I don't know where people get this shit from. He was so raw and so vulnerable during that visit. That was probably like the closest I felt to him, which is kind of weird considering the situation. At CFRC, you can either stay like in the lunchroom visitation area or you can step outside and, you know, walk around a little bit. I think they had like little park benches or something out there. Jeremy didn't want to leave the table because um, I guess if you step outside, you can't hold each other. I don't, I don't know, we never made it out there. Um, so he wanted to stay inside because he wanted to be able to hold me and touch me. And that felt really good. Um, he just, I don't, I don't want to say that, like he was clinging on to me, but I could tell that he really needed me. He was a little anxious because he didn't know where he was going to end up. He didn't know if he was going to be, you know, up in Tallahassee or Miami or some other place that was too far for people to really come and see him. He's really happy now to be in Sumter because it's relatively close to his support system. And from what I was told, Sumter County has a really good prison system. Um, I think it's probably one of the cleanest and one of the best in the state. Jeremy is, you know, he's always going to be able to adapt to wherever he is. He's always gonna figure out the system and, you know, get in where he fits in, basically. So when I saw him at CFRC, he was still a little cocky. He was still, you know, the same guy that you, you see somewhat in the videos. He was wearing these sunglasses. I'm like, where the fuck did you get these? Like, you know, he was just cool Jeremy, arrogant Jeremy, the same person basically. But there was still like this vulnerability there. There was still, you could tell it was, it was hard for him to be there. He wanted to go home. He kept saying that. He's like, I want to go home with you. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go home with you. I'm so glad that, you know, he only has a little bit of time. I, I don't, it was hard. I don't even know how to explain it. I know that when he gets home, he's going to have to adjust to a lot he's gonna have to adjust to not having his business anymore and I mean there are other things going on in the background especially after Vidler was 
fired. I'm not going to talk about that right now. I think that's something that Jeremy should discuss. But, you know, I basically told him that, you know, you have to change the way that you handle things. You have to make sure that you don't do the same things that you were doing before, no matter what it is, just the way that you respond to things. Like you can't continue to live this life where you're in and out of the system. It's just not a life for anyone to live. I do think that he was receptive to what I was saying and maybe it was the atmosphere that we were in. I felt like it was the first time that he ever really listened to me because Jeremy doesn't listen to anyone. He also apologized to me for a lot of things that he, you know, he'd done to me in the past. Um, and I already said I would do a video about the DV case. I will, I will do that video eventually. Um, but he gave me a heartfelt apology for everything surrounding that. He said, you know, he said, I never should have put my hands on you. I, I never should have touched you in any way. And I, I felt like he was sincere when he said that. I'm not excusing, you know, what he did. I'm just giving you all, you know, the conversation <laughs> that we had. Um, I, I don't know why he did the things that he did to me. I, I don't understand it. I don't know why he felt like that was the right response for those situations. But like I said, um, that's a separate video and we'll, we'll get into that later. We will also talk about the baby. We'll talk about um, the way that he handled that. We'll talk about those jail calls. Um, I do want to say really quickly that I actually heard the jail calls um, before everyone else did. Jeremy was making several jail calls, uh, not just to me, but to other people in his family, in particular, the person that he claims is his wife. And um, the prosecution actually reached out to me with, um, I don't want to give her the wrong title <laughs> because she's so wonderful. She is the supervisor, she's the director, she's the person over all the DV cases as far as being an advocate for victims. So she reached out to me and the prosecutor, who is also wonderful, um, she also reached out to me and they said, you know, Jennifer, we think you might want to listen to some of these calls that Jeremy is making. And then, of course, I listened to them and all hell broke loose. But again, that is a separate video. Um, Jeremy did acknowledge that during the visit and... Again, he was apologizing and saying that he was so sorry and just, you know, basically telling me what I wanted to hear. I'm not going to share everything that we talked about. I was there from, like I said, 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. So we did discuss a lot. And I told Jeremy, you know, I emphasize again that things need to change. And I gave him that timeline, that time frame of what needs to change and when it needs to change or I am leaving. That's when he started saying that he was going to show me how he was going to commit to me in a real way, not just, okay, like this is my girlfriend, side chick, whatever. It was going to be something that was real. He said that he realized that I was doing a lot for him and I'd always done a lot for him and coming to see him meant a lot, especially since, you know, his wife wasn't doing that at all. She wasn't seeing him. She was barely answering the phones. I think I said this in my lies and infidelity video where I was telling you guys that sometimes people marry for different reasons. Sometimes people stay in relationships for different reasons. It's not always love. The irony is not lost on me that, you know, Jeremy chose to throw me under the bus. Um, when was that? Like eight, nine months ago, he chose to throw me under the bus um, for this person. And this person is nowhere to be found as usual. So yeah, it's not lost on me. It wasn't all, you know, doom and gloom and dark conversations. We did have fun, but me and Jeremy, we always have fun. Like we always laugh. And that's one of the things that he loves about me. He says that like I'm one of the funniest women that he's ever been with. And he always has fun with me and he doesn't even have that in the marriage that he's in. So, you know, we just sat there, we stayed inside because he didn't want to go outside. He wanted to, you know, stay connected to me. Um, so we just sat there, we ate some, I guess you can call it food. We had uh, some beverages. Jeremy ate a lot. He had, I think I had half of a, a cheeseburger and I guess it was, I guess it was hamburger meat. I don't know what kind of meat it was, but I had 
half of a cheeseburger and then I had like two or three chicken nuggets which were pretty good and then I had a coca-cola and I think Jeremy gave me like two or three sips of a diet coke Jeremy had four packs of chicken nuggets so each pack of chicken nuggets comes with like six it's six in a pack so he had 24 chicken nuggets and then he had these long like hoagies like these mcrib sandwiches he had two of those then he had a bunch of you know diet cokes i don't even know how many diet cokes he had i think it was like four or five so yeah he ate pretty well during that visit we had a great time like we hugged and we kissed and we laughed and we were able to discuss things freely because nothing was being recorded. It's amazing. Like when your entire life is not being recorded, you don't have to be careful about what you say. You can you can speak freely. So he was, you know, he was telling me what was happening to him in jail before he was moved over to prison. Then he was telling me what was going on in the prison system. We were able to discuss legal situations we were able to discuss our future without everything being recorded and it felt so good just being able to be open and free when it was time to go i mean it was i think it was really hard for him to let me go i don't think he wanted to let me go um and i don't know i don't know I, i'm really happy that i saw him that I had those moments with him. It was really special for me. I don't know how anyone who can claim to love him and support him and care about him, I don't know how anyone can just not show up. I mean, obviously, they don't care about him. They don't really love him. I mean, that's that's clear to see. Your actions show everything. Um, but it's interesting to me that they can claim that they do. I will probably do more videos about my visitations with Jeremy. Um, I don't know how interesting other people would find that. I I would find it to be interesting if I was following an inmate and I was, you know, on the outside looking in and I wanted to know how they were doing. I also wanted to say really quickly that I, I don't know how, but um, people have uh, found my email address. I don't know how they did that, but they found it. I haven't received a lot, so I'm I'm guessing it may be the same person or it's just like a couple of people who found it and they're not sharing it with others maybe because they want to be the only ones communicating I, I don't know but I did receive an email I think it was like early this morning and I read it because it seemed relatively normal and the person I'm not going to say uh, his name but he asked me about two individuals and um, if he's watching this I don't know anyone um that any other youtubers are talking about uh, i've never heard those names so they're probably really irrelevant the names of the two people were logan and marshall or something like that i have no fucking listen i don't know any logans i don't know any marshalls um i don't know who those fucking people are so i'm assuming you're probably watching my videos i don't know who the fuck that is and jeremy has never told me about a logan or a marshall so yeah I, I don't know i'm sorry honey but i appreciate the email it was it was nice i do have the comments turn off for a reason i'll get into those reasons later uh it's mostly racism i will make a separate video about the racist disgusting comments that i receive on a daily basis um and also i will you know, talk about ways that I will be able to communicate with other people and whether or not the comments will ever be turned on. To the people, tell them high beams and hazards and stay as close as possible to the vehicle in front of them. All right. Ask them first if they're going to the cemetery. If they say yes, high beams, hazards, stay as close to the vehicle in front of you. This is why they're so expensive. You're making them out of these nice car stuff. I, I, yeah, well, the fucking... The Office Depot didn't have the actual regular stuff. I'm like, really? It's like Starbucks not having fun. Exactly. The thing was covered in camera. Are you going with us to the cemetery, ma'am? Are you going with us oh, yeah. to the cemetery? That's not my name. Front dash. They got their own. That's it? They all look. Look, they've got their own. Oh. Alright, I'm on. Yep. Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah, the hazard. I got disconnected. No, it just went dead. No, I just, I mean, I just disconnected. No, my phone's fully charged. People don't know how to drive, man. They kept cutting in and out, slowing down. What? These people don't know how to drive. They kept slowing down. There'd be like eight car spaces. They'd pull out in front of me, pull back in. Can 
Do you have another escort? No. Okay. Sorry. Tight gloves, two switches. It's not like we flipped the switches on you the last time you rode it. Hey, hey, why don't you sit on it and spin? Pants, pants. On the left or right side of my bike? Huh? We're parking it. Oh. Cowie is this one over here. Have that man who can bike for you all, man. Yeah, it's the only hobby I have. So you have this one and then the white one that you use. So that's your wife. And then we have more. Is that the new Cowie? Oh, you haven't seen it? No, I, I just looked. Uh, what are you getting this guy? 